Adam, I think it'd be really helpful for people to distinguish between awareness and attention. Or how, how do you think about that? So awareness, arousal, attention are different, right? They all intersect. Arousal is obviously just your general sense of whether you're drowsy or awake, um, but it intersects with your attention and your attention as I said, it's complicated. Attention includes focus and ignoring. And things that are in your, usually in your top down attention, they're in your awareness, but attention's complicated. So things that may be pulling your attention in a bottom up way may be completely outside of your awareness, right? We call that like subconscious decisions that you make. Um, so, you know, it's, they're, they're, they overlap. Um, they're not like completely orthogonal, but they, they intersect all the time, those three concepts. So bottom-up attention, we were talking about arousal. You're essentially talking about an acetylcholine reaction. Top-down, same thing. Is it also acetylcholine? Um, I know, I mean, if the minute you get excited or anxious or whatever, you've got other neurochemicals coming in. But I was just wondering if it's the same system, bottom-up and top-down. Yeah, I would say so. Um, we see the cholinergic system involved in both of those types of attentional processes. It's probably how it has a lot of its benefit in in um, conditions like dementia, where we give cholinesterase inhibitors to a boost acetylcholine levels. But that's a, it's a good question, and it's something that is an active area of research in, in parsing out its different roles and different types of attention. So am I right, Adam, based on what you were saying previously, in thinking that you know that there's, there can be distractions that are outside of our awareness or outside of our conscious awareness, yet still distracting us, even, even though they don't you know, feel like they are Undoubtedly. I mean, that is, you know, it's a, it's a massive source of distraction or bottom up influences that could fall outside of our awareness. They could be both internal and external. That's a, yet another uh, way of breaking down attention. Um, you could direct your attention inward, like in a lot of meditation practices, you can uh, uh, put your attention externally, just like your attention can be focused internally or externally, your, um, the interference in attention. So I think I like the concept of interference. Like it, it sits well with how we think about signal and noise, right? You know, you're trying to get a signal in the radio and there's noise. That's the same thing with attention. Attention is you're trying to have a signal based upon, let's say, your goals, and there is interference and noise. That's what I think of largely as distraction and then multitasking. And if you want, we could I could break down sort of the conceptual framework that we built to separate out distraction and multitasking. I think they're different types of interference. But both of those types of interference, distraction, which is completely irrelevant information, you're trying to ignore, you want to ignore, and multitasking is when you make the decision to engage in more than one stream. Both of those types of interference can enter and cause interference, both externally or internally, and they can occur both with and without awareness. Can I ask a weird question here? When we're distracted, where does the signal show up in the brain? When we say <laughs> distraction interrupts attention, what are we actually talking about at a, at a, at a process, at a structural level? It depends. It depends on, on the type of distraction and the type of activities that you're engaged in at the moment. So as we all know, and, and, and I bet a lot of your uh, listeners appreciate this, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause on it for a moment because it's so important. Um, our brain doesn't work as a bunch of separated islands of processing. They, it really it works as a network. It's an interconnected dynamic system that is constantly shuttling information in, in all, you know, all of its great extent of processing. Now, when you are engaged in a certain activity, let's say it's a visual activity, there's lots of areas that are associated with what's going on, right? So you have your visual cortex in the occipital lobe where you're processing that visual information. Um, obviously, it's coming in through the brainstem through the, and passed through the thalamus. But then you have the prefrontal cortex, which is where your top-down control is largely thought to be mediated from, right? And we know this is the most evolved part of our brain. We see that there's a network of functional, there are st certainly structural connections between, but functional <coughs> connections between them. And then of course, if there's memories involved, your hippocampus is part of this network, emotional salience, then you have your amygdala. And so you have this network of brain areas and the network has to be engaged in order for you to process it in a, in a meaningful high fidelity manner. When we 
present someone with interference, we see a couple things. So if the interference is just a distraction, then what we find is that there is a loss of fidelity of the resolution of that information that's being maintained in the sensory cortex where it's being processed. So that's why I said it depends, right? So it's specific based upon whether it's auditory or visual information that you're processing at the time. And, and we could see that in a whole bunch of different signals. Interestingly enough, um, what we find in the set of this, in, in the setting of distractions is that you can often maintain that network, but it's presumably from at least as far as we can tell from the measurements that we do, it's still activated, although probably not, and we can know this from the behavioral data, not processing as high uh, at, at a higher fidelity level. If your interference is my wife bottom up stimulus if your interference <laughs> is um multitasking right so if it is another task that you're engaged in then what happens is that network basically breaks down and you form a new network um and then that new network lets you approach that task with you know high and high fidelity and then when you switch back you basically break down that network and reactivate another network. We've seen this with both fMRI and some degree with EEG recording as well. And so those two types of interference, distraction and, and multitasking, a secondary task, seem to have a different uh, signature upon which they break down uh, performance. And so that's how we, um, at least when we're looking at this from a neuroscience perspective, how we make sense of why we can't seem to just completely filter out everything that's irrelevant based on our goals and why we're not able to take our attention and apply it to more than one task at a time. Because what we do not see is that we parallel process those two networks simultaneously. And so that's a little bit of the neuroscience behind distraction multitasking mm -hmm. impacts. Is there an analogy or a visual that you use when describing awareness versus attention versus arousal? And I've heard of that idea of, you know, the, the lighthouse with the fog beam being uh, awareness and then a more specific, you know, beam being attention. Do you, do you use any kind of analogy to, to sort of tie a bow in that for folks? I mean, I haven't really thought of an analogy that tie them all together. Obviously, the spotlight of attention is a classic um, visual analogy that we use to sort of help people understand how you can move the spotlight around and things are outside of its awareness. To, I don't really love the spotlight analogy because what we've learned in our research is that it's not really like a spotlight because what's happening is a spotlight implies like one directional influence. Right, so like you're putting a light on something and everything else is denied light. That's not what we find in our research. What we find is that when you pay attention and focus on something, it's true, it's getting the lion's share of your processing and you see tons of different neural indicators showing that that's true. But what we have found is that your processing of the irrelevant information is not just denied the focus, it's actually actively suppressed. And so I view both attending and ignoring as active processes. And mm. we've actually shown in our research that they can be dissociated. One of our, one of our first papers showed that older adults are able to focus like 20 year olds, but not ignore. And that's what creates all of their attentional problems. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, Please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple, Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 